When a user requests a web page, a server must process the request and provide a response. This is known as the request response model and is one of the fundamental ways devices in a network communicate with each other. If you want a fast website, the first step is to shorten the time between the client's request and the server's response. This is where the time to first byte metric comes into play. Time to first byte, or TTFB, measures how long the client has to wait before receiving the first byte of data from the server. Server response time is often used as a synonym to TTFB, but they're not exactly the same. TTFB provides a better idea of the user experience since it takes into account not only how long the server takes to process a request, but also how much the client waits for the response to arrive. A few different factors can affect this metric. The first one is the client's and the server's internet connections. The server's load also plays a big role. If the server has to execute too much code for complex tasks like preparing dynamic content and making lots of database calls, its response time takes a hit. The last one is the physical distance. When the client and the server are far away from each other, data arrives slower as it travels over a long distance. While we can't control our visitors' network quality, we can shorten the physical distance between them and our site. We can also reduce the load on our servers and make sure they respond quickly. In terms of benchmarks, anything below 200 milliseconds is considered a good TTFB. The 200 to 500 milliseconds range is pretty average when working with dynamic content. Anything around 600 milliseconds or more usually points to an issue on the server side, especially when testing from locations close to the server. KeyCDN's performance test tool is an easy way to see how much distance affects our site's TTFB. If we use the example.com domain, we can see that this metric varies quite a lot, from under 5 milliseconds in the US to over 450 milliseconds in India. These results indicate that example.com is hosted somewhere in the US and likely doesn't provide content from servers near Bangalore or Singapore, for example. We can test pages from other locations with more advanced tools like Web Page Test. This tool lets us test from over 20 locations while emulating a device with a specific connection. When we test a page, we can open the waterfall chart, click on the main document, and see the TTFB. If you don't know where your website's visitors are located, check out the Geo and Technology reports in Google Analytics or in your monitoring tool of choice. We now know how to measure the first page speed moment, so let's talk about optimizing it. First, we need a fast host server. Many cheaper hosting plans are shared, meaning the server's processor and memory are divided between users. This can slow down response times, so consider investing in dedicated hosting. There's no one-size-fits-all approach here since the specific choice depends on a few variables, including your budget and website traffic. You can find links in the description for websites that review and compare hosting companies. Use them to find one that offers good performance, along with high availability, security, and support. Next, third-party plugins and libraries can also hurt response times. These add-ons make our jobs easier, but usually at the expense of page speed since they increase the amount of code that has to be executed. This is a common problem in working with content management systems like WordPress. That's why it's important to choose a lightweight theme and audit each plugin before installing it. If page speed takes a hit after adding a new plugin, it might be better to choose another option. In a lot of cases, the added functionality isn't worth the massive server overhead. We also need caching layers to shorten the physical distance between our content and our visitors. In the context of the web, caching means storing a copy of HTML pages or specific resources like images or fonts in a different location than the origin server. Once cached, resources don't need to be re-downloaded from our server every time. Two popular caching techniques are full page caching and object caching. We can use page caching to serve pre-rendered content to our visitors and object caching to speed up data retrieval from a database. Both techniques can massively reduce TTFB. Also, we can get a content delivery network to cache and distribute entire pages or specific assets from a server that's closer to our users. You can implement a caching policy by hand via your server's HTTP headers or with a service like NitroPack that takes care of the process for you. 
Over the following weeks, we'll dive even deeper into caching and content delivery networks. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you in the next episode.